fresh out of college, the summer of 1983, I spent six weeks on a peace study mission trip of sorts in South Africa. I was part of a group of 10 young Presbyterians trying to build cross-cultural relationships with other Protestants across the church. It was an incredibly challenging summer, and I must confess my heart broke many times. The first week of our time there, we were part of a large young adult gathering with people with shades and hues of all kinds, black and white, Indian and mixed, or colored, as they called it. I'd flown there by myself, arriving two days later than the rest of my group because I was detained at home. So I'm two days behind in understanding what's going on. But as a wide-eyed optimist, I was ready for us to start the process of building relationships and dismantling apartheid right away. But at this retreat, the leaders, they were talking about building a wall. And the call to action, the clarion call was a rise and build. Pass me another brick. I remember being so confused. I mean, why were we talking about this guy named Nehemiah and building a wall? When we were there to break down walls of apartheid and sin and division that separated us. Well, I soon came to realize that this group of mixed race individuals, this group of faithful folk were talking about something larger than I was understanding. They were talking about foundational stuff, their identity as people of faith, a faith that bridges human divisions like the color of one's skin. They were talking about being stronger together, being resilient to face what comes even as they lived in a world full of criticism and chaos. Hmm. Even though there have been times when I have wondered why this obscure narrative account of the restoration of Jerusalem after the Babylonian exile ever made it into the Bible, I now see that there's more going on here than Nehemiah leading his people to rebuild a literal wall. There are lessons of faith and leadership and strategies for remaining resilient as we go through life. Last week, McGray de Vega talked about one such strategy Nehemiah modeled for us, and that was prayer. So let's get right into it and see what we can learn or be reminded of today. We start in chapter two, our story picks up. We get more drama. We hear about enemies and critics of Nehemiah. And we also learn that he had some partners as well. You might recall from last week's sermon that Nehemiah had been one of those exiles who after Jerusalem fell was living in Babylon. And there over time, he gained the trust of the king. So in the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah opens, we learn that he is serving as the king's cupbearer. Now the Jews had been in exile for about 40 years and Nehemiah had heard now recently of the possibility of returning to Jerusalem. And he'd also heard news of how bad the situation was, how the buildings were in disrepair and the wall, the wall that surrounded the city needed to be rebuilt. He was distressed and this news weighed heavily on him. He cried and fasted and prayed, for four months. And then one night he took wine into the king and he showed his sadness, not putting his best face forward. He showed his true feelings. And the king asked, are you sick? <laughs> Why do you look so sad? And Nehemiah was quite frightened, but he showed some humility and deference for the king, even though he believed what he was about to ask for was a vision straight from God. And Nehemiah said, May the king live forever, but I am sad because the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and the gates of that city have been destroyed by fire. And then verse four picks up. Then the king said to me, what do you want me to do? To that question, Nehemiah's first response is prayer. Before I answered, I prayed to the God of heaven. Now imagine, imagine this moment. This moment is the culmination of four months of prayer. And Nehemiah recognized the moment and he acted in faith. He put his faith in action and he was bold to ask. 
if it would please the king, and if I have been good to you, please send me to Jerusalem, the city in Judah, where my ancestors are buried. I want to go there and rebuild that city. I want to go there and rebuild that city. Last week, McGray talked about a leader in our community, Dr. Chloe Coney, who's been living out her God-inspired vision to rebuild, revitalize East Tampa for over 30 years. She's been doing this through the Community Development Corporation of Tampa and through the CDC of Tampa's Nehemiah Project Community Building. Interestingly enough, it's called Brick by Brick. Dr. Coney has been helping to create new businesses, revitalize commercial areas, offer jo job training, and encourage youth leadership programs, increase home ownership throughout East Tampa. And she often refers to Nehemiah and the lessons she has learned from his story as she makes these bold asks of people in authority so she can leverage economic impact. You know, you just have to talk to Chloe for a short time and she will bring Nehemiah up in a conversation. So back to the Bible. As it turns out, the king was amenable. He was agreeable to Nehemiah's request. He gave Nehemiah permission to go to Jerusalem. And in the process, Nehemiah rightly anticipated that there might be opposition. So he proactively asked the king for some protections and the king gave it to him. The king gave him letters that expressed his favor in Nehemiah's plans, but he also provided him with horses and guards to keep him safe along the way. These letters showed Nehemiah's credentials to any skeptical governor or official from the neighboring regions. And verse eight says, the king gave me what I asked for, for the gracious power of my God was with me. Yes, one thing we've seen throughout the book is how God uses the world's power, the earthly authority of a king in this case, to accomplish God's purposes. Indeed, we serve an awesome God. When Nehemiah arrived and presented himself to the officials, some were not happy, particularly a guy named Sanballat, the governor of Samaria, and Tobiah, the governor of Amnon. They were unnerved. They were distressed that someone was coming to seek the good of the Israelites, the ones who were still left in the land. Tensions arose because with the arrival of Nehemiah, Sanballat's power over Jerusalem was now uncertain. But Nehemiah persisted. He surveyed the land, he built some rapport with the local people, and he began to work on the wall. But all along the way, his enemies, his detractors, his critics, ridiculed and mocked him. They did everything possible to discourage his work. They threatened to tell untrue stories about Nehemiah. But nevertheless, he persisted because Nehemiah knew he was doing a great work and could not come down from the wall so as to debate these enemies. He persisted even when adversity came. God's people cannot give up when adversity comes. We cannot give up when hardship and difficulty come. Earlier this week, I called Dr. Chloe Coney on the phone and I said, thinking about your story, I'm just guessing some people were not real happy with your work. Did you ever face criticism for what you were doing in the community? This is her response. Oh yes, there were community gatekeepers like Sanballat and Tobiah who enjoyed the neighborhood as it was. They had power and they asked me, who are you, Chloe Coney? Where did you come from? Who gave you the power? She continued, the question is, and one I've had to ask myself is, Chloe, do you have the passion to be a change agent? If the answer is yes, then you gotta keep going. You can't give up. So I kept going. Oh, they accused me of trying to put black boys in jail. And I just wanted to clean up the streets. I wanted these young people to have a life and a future. In truth, one reason I got involved was because a senior citizen told me that she was afraid to sit on her porch 
because of all the drug deals going on in front of her house. Sadly, some city officials didn't like the work we were doing either. But we were building houses. We were creating a youth center. We were cleaning up the streets. Oh, Sally, she said, I trusted God. And I knew I was doing a great work for the Lord. And I said, I can't come down. Nehemiah met opposition and God provided. Chloe met opposition and God provided. But even though she is an amazing human being, she's not the only change agent following a vision from God. Nor is she the only one who's had to face criticism like Nehemiah and been resilient. This week, I've thought about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who before he wrote the letter from a Birmingham jail, he received a letter signed by many religious leaders of his day, bishops and clergy, Methodist, Presbyterian, Episcopalian, Jewish, Baptist, all of them imploring him to slow down, be patient. You're moving too fast, Martin. And his response basically was the same as Nehemiah's. I cannot come down off of this wall. So what about you and me? Hmm. Maybe it's not transforming a city block or taking on city hall, but maybe it is changing one person's life or one perspective at a time. It could be that the good work you are being called to do is speaking up in a meeting or speaking out against something you know is wrong or simply acknowledging an inequality that needs repair. Doing that might make you feel uncomfortable and quite possibly could make you face criticism from your peers or pressure from loved ones, but you know it's the right thing to do. And so you must speak, you must act. Nehemiah's example reminds us that God's people cannot give up when adversity comes. Nehemiah didn't give up. Chloe didn't give up. She was resilient because God provided. How? How did God provide for her? What did God do? Oh, friends, God provided her with the gift of faith and gave her the encouragement of the Holy Spirit. God equipped her to know how to engage available resources in the community. God equips you in that way, too. And God gave her a church family, a community of believers to share her burdens, her obstacles and challenges. So how about you? How is God providing for you in these days to overcome whatever it is that critics are hurling at you? Oh, friends, you too have a faith. You have a relationship with God. God wants it to be close. And if it's not feeling particularly close right now, it can be deepened. It can be nurtured so that the presence of the Holy One seems more real, more intimate, more tangible. I believe God is working God's purposes out in this world. And maybe, no, quite lightly, it is through you. What's the good work God is calling you to? Remember, God provided for Nehemiah and for Chloe, and God provides for you. And the call to action for all of us is arise and build. Pass me another brick. Would you pray with me? Oh, thank you, God. Thank you, for you have blessed us with the witnesses of folks like Nehemiah and Chloe and Martin and so many others. Help us not give up when adversity comes, but rather be willing vessels, builders of your reign on earth. This we ask in your name, Jesus. Amen. 